So we have a very special keynote speaker with us today. Um, this is a gentleman who brings not just the, the background and the pedigree of being in the media business, but is special for this group because he began his career early on as a principal. So he comes to us not just um, as the person representing participant media, but as a person with an education background. And I think one of the things that's special about participants' support of Namely is their interest in bringing together films that have a, a social, justice, social justice or social change message to them, a very strong interest in having educators access those films, and then a future where they're looking for new ways to bring those things to, to an audience and an audience of educators as well. They have some new, uh, ne a new network that's going to be programming shortly that Jim's going to tell you about. But I hope you'll give your attention, even as you're eating your delicious food, give your attention to the CEO of Participant Media. Please welcome Jim Burke. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. There we go. Now you can go back to chewing. Please go ahead and eat. If your back is to me, I'm not insulted yet. I will be about 20 minutes into this. Uh, but uh, it is, uh, it's a, actually, it's a pleasure to be here for a couple reasons. It's a pleasure to be here because uh, I believe very much in the work of this organization. And uh, I do share a common experience with many of you in the room. I started as a teacher, actually, at Carson High School. And uh, I had the uh, good fortune of uh, 21 years old uh, going into a music program. I've got a music background. That... Uh, where the uh, band director had run away with all of the school uniforms, sold the school instruments, and uh, I was a 20-year-old uh, white Jewish kid going into a school that gave you an extra $1,100 for what they called um, incentive pay for a hard-to-staff school. Uh, we called it combat pay. Uh, and the reality was it was an absolutely extraordinary and amazing experience. The kids were phenomenal. The program was phenomenal. But What's so interesting is that this, this place, this hallowed hall of the Marriott, which might just be a convention hotel to you, was the place where the band would gather. You know, this was a 230-piece marching band from no band at all, and a 150-piece drill team and banner girls and all that stuff with kids that 75% uh, had never been on a plane before we went on our first trip. And 80% uh, uh, parents were not high school graduates. And here we were celebrating like the big prom, like the Academy Awards, like the Grammys, uh, each year coming here to culminate uh, what was a really exciting program. But my, my, years, my, my years at Carson High School were extraordinary. And then I went on to Hamilton, as was mentioned, and started an Academy of Music and Fine Arts, uh, which is now uh, uh, continues to operate 25 years later. And uh, it's a wonderful program. It was the uh, first of its type in the Western United States, kind of a fame school for for Los Angeles Unified School District, and then went on to become the uh, youngest principal in the history of the school district, which was fun because the high school had uh, 2,800 kids when I left, and uh, I was uh, 29 years old when I became principal, and the average age of a principal was 62. So uh, it was, uh, well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, everybody, and I'll take it on that. But. It was, a, it, was, it was a real experience, and actually, the interesting thing is, separate from the doctorate and the masters and all the other stuff, everything I learned, I learned in the classroom about how to run a company, how not to run a company, how to try to inspire and compel change because you couldn't make people do things, you had to motivate them to do things. And it was a completely different uh, approach compared to the conventional business school background where you learn there's the right way, the wrong way, you just do this, you tell people to do it, and they do it. And real world doesn't work that way, and, and, and most of you know that. Uh, the, other, the other observation is that this is an interesting group because all of you in here uh, are experts in your field, both in the K through 12 and, and higher education, which is a whole other conversation over a glass of wine about why they call post-12 higher education, and does that denote an insult K through 12, but that's a high school teacher speaking. But how many of you are K through 12 background or involved in that area? I'm just curious if you could see, or raise your hands, thank you. Uh, that's interesting, so it's split about 60-40, it looks like in the room between uh, uh, the two 
groups. Mostly when you speak to a keynote of media executives or entertainment executives, the interest is more about what's in the goodie bag. And for you guys, you're going to probably be parsing words as I uh, make some observations about media impact and literacy, and, uh, which is why I volunteered to run over so that there'd be no Q&A afterwards and not a chance for you to come back and go at me. But unfortunately, I was told that's not, not the case. So we'll get into it. And the other thing is, uh, I know you're a fan of PowerPoints. And although you see this up here, I do not have a PowerPoint. Uh, I actually have even some videos. And, uh, and uh, a couple pretty graphs and charts to hopefully um, uh, capture your attention when you get bored with my voice. But, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I was asked to come here to talk about how participant uses storytelling and media to illuminate the issues that shape our lives. And really, in particular, how media literacy intersects with the work that we do. Now, we're a media company. That's what Participant is. So because of that, rather than me talk to you about what Participant is, I'd like to show you a brief clip from one of our early films that really speaks to why we're in this business. So this scene from Good Night and Good Luck, thank you, beautifully uh, articulates for us why participant exists. And Edward R. Murrow's, his words speak to the power of media to inform and in, in, the, in how we can inspire people to learn about the world around them, which in turn empowers participation in a better world. So that's at the heart of our business model and in many ways intersects with the work of Namely and with many of you. Now, what we do is not new. I mean, participant is unique, but the idea of a socially relevant or socially conscious or social justice film, it's always been part of the industry. And it's always helped us understand important issues and thrust something into the zeitgeist that maybe wouldn't have gotten there otherwise by shining an important spotlight. And we go back, films like Gandhi, Hotel Rwanda, Norma Ray, Aaron Brockovic, and go on and on and on. Films like this have always been part of Hollywood. But what makes what we do at Participant a little bit unique, not better, just different, what makes it a little bit unique is that it's the only thing that we focus on. Because we believe that socially relevant content deserves a platform of its own, and it has the power to be a, vo a, a real powerful and strong voice for social change. And we think media literacy is a core responsibility of our company. So our founder, Jeff Skoll, uh, believed that people, if inspired and given the tools, would make the world a better place. It sounds a bit naive, and, and uh, it maybe is, unless you happen to have $5 billion and you've decided to spend your entire life doing that and actually doing the types of things that are changing the world. So when he, he was the first president, uh, and first employee of eBay, and after he left eBay, he said, this is what I'm going to do with my money, and this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, because I believe that we can tip the axis of the world 
in a better place if we can get people to think about the world around them and then become engaged. So we formed the Skull Foundation, which is this billion dollar foundation, which really drives uh, social change through social entrepreneurs working around the world to solve the problems right in the front line. But he realized that if you want to invite a large community, get them engaged, if you want to get people to stand up and really demand that something happens, that it's media that's the gateway to making that happen. So our job is to tell stories that would illuminate the issues shaping the world and then invite the audience to take action and join a community afterwards to stay involved. So we're nine and a half years old, 43 films so far. And uh, we've had this year alone 15 million measurable social actions across all of our platforms, including TakePart.com, uh, which is a, a platform of social change where we can transact uh, the way to put content and actions and link them together. So we have evidence that you can entertain and you can compel positive social change. But people have to believe that the source is trusted, that the story is inspiring, and that the information is authentic, and that they want to learn. But to do this, the audience has to have the tools to understand, and this is why this work is so important, and that's why media literacy is a core functionality of the work that we do. Now, over the past decade, we've spent and continue to spend a very large amount of time working to understand how people activate. What makes them interested in the issues? And how do we present the information in a way that is meaningful so they raise their hand and they say, I want to help. I understand. I get it. I want to be involved. Tell me the different options I have. Don't tell me what to do, but tell me the different options I have, and I'm going to pick one of those. So over time, what we've learned doing pretty much everything wrong in terms of how we try to reach audiences using these films and learning over this period of time what specific strategies have given us the ability to establish that authentic relationship with an audience after they've seen a film and then keep that connection with them so that we can drive meaningful change. So here is our bit of our top ten list. First, you have to tell a story. First and foremost, it starts with a good story. It's how you establish an emotional connection. And for us, the story is binary. So, we will not move forward in developing a film, no matter how important the issue is, unless we have a powerful story. And when you believe you have this really powerful story, you have to pursue it with total conviction. Because a lot of times, other people won't see it the way you do. With the help, for example. Catherine Stockett, the author, grew up with the gentleman who ended up directing the film, Tay Taylor. So they grew up together in the South, Five years old they met, and they made a pinky promise to each other at five. She said, I'm going to write a book one day. And he said, I'm going to direct your book. And 20 years later, she wrote a book. And she went to her best friend, Tate, and said, I wrote a book. And Tate said, you promised me you'd let me direct it. He never directed a feature film. They went off to Hollywood with this best-selling book now, after most book publishers had passed and one didn't. And off it went, two million copies sold. Every single studio passed. Everyone. She promised that she would follow the book. She promised it would be an authentic telling, and they passed. The fear was that a historical, female-driven, civil rights drama about housekeepers wouldn't do any business. But for us, when we read it, the story was mesmerizing. The characters were rich. The characters were complex. We had such a feeling of, of, of connection with these people, and it didn't matter that that was then. What mattered to us was the story was resonating. And what's interesting is when the film opened, I got a call that there were protests going on at 20 theaters in Southern California, primarily Los Angeles. And the response is, over what? what? What would you be against? With, I, I, I can't, they're not protesting against the film, they're protesting for the film, but the people protesting were actually Hispanic housekeepers who were the next generation of the help, who were, actually had signs asking people to go see the film because they, were, they felt a, kin, kin, a kinship with the generation that was being portrayed in the film. So again, if you want to start to, if you want to talk about a social issue in a meaningful way, you have to have 
a story that really resonates. One other example quickly would be The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, which again is a film that when you think about it, we're gonna, here's the idea. Can you imagine the pitch when you come in a room? We've got this story, it's a comedy. And it's a comedy about hopelessness, healthcare, old age, retirement, and displaced families who have to leave their country because they can't afford to live with dignity. You know, what we saw again was a poignant story and emotional uh, connectivity and, it, and that created that genuine connection that really drove home the plight of the characters, which then allowed us to talk about those issues. So, We've talked about starting with a story. The next piece is what we call shine a light. Now, within the context of a story, you can integrate information, which not only helps the storyline, but also can simplify a complex issue. For example, Contagion. Even though this was a suspense thriller about a global pandemic, we grounded the story in scientific facts to do two things. One, we want to add to the plausibility of the film's premise and allow us to embed moments of education within the story. And so, this is an example of how we did that. So, the transparency is one of the core pillars. I saw it up on the board uh, from the morning uh, brainstorms that were going on. So, how many of you in here honestly knew what an R naught was before that? Everybody here knew what an R naught was. All right. How many knew what one was? Okay. Thank you. If nothing else, don't listen to anything I say. But at least you've learned about R naughts today. And, and again, that was when, when we were doing script review of that, the answer was, oh, cut that whole two-minute scene out. We should get rid of it. And the answer is, wait a minute, there's a moment here where you can actually establish credibility that this thing is real, that this disease, this, this pandemic could really occur, and this is how it happens, and you drop that in there. And so that's that ability to create that, that moment of education. So if you want to get people involved we know that you have to inspire them at some point. So again, this is, I can inform them, I have to tell a good story, but I have to do something that makes them want to learn more, that makes them want to seek to understand. So if you take an issue like climate change, the sheer volume of information when you think about climate change and counter information to that information is overwhelming for the average person. Before an inconvenient truth, our documentary on climate change, was released. Polls suggested that 
30% of Americans believe global warming was a real issue. 30%. So our focus became how do we use the film as a way to create an understanding in, an, in, in a way that was distilled down so that people would be open to learning more and we could propel the issue into the national zeitgeist. And the combination of the timing of the film coming out, everything that surrounded our interest in what was the former next president of the United States in his first public appearance after two years, and the uh, horrendous uh, disaster in, with Katrina, all converged to create this moment of, of national zeitgeist and debate. So what we did then is wanted to continue the experience off the screen and, and develop online and classroom curriculum materials that would support using the film as a, as a way to inspire people wanting to learn more. So we created downloadable curriculum, 180,000 teachers grabbed that. And after the film, six countries, Scotland, Czech Republic, England, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, and Canada all incorporated the curriculum into their national curriculum, which uh, was adopted for the first time on climate change. And one year after the film, and the time in Katrina, and these other issues happening, 87% of the, of the country said that it was an issue of concern. Now, it's interesting, if you, pull the, if you pull in stories, if you pull media, if you pull content out of the public zeitgeist, in that absence, other things can jump in, if you're not media literate, to change a public's perception of something. So we sit here today where that number is now half of what it was. It's eroded. Because we've seen in the, after the first burst, misinformation and a veil over transparency started to occur on an incremental basis year after year after year, and so we find ourselves losing half of the progress that we've made. So more the reason to talk about the importance of media literacy and how people must learn to decipher the difference between truth and deception, and I know, I know you know this more than, far more than I do. Uh, one other example is with the soloist. So here's a case where we wanted to put a human face on homelessness because all of us come into contact with it. We know it exists. We walk by those people. We either say no thank you. We drop a dollar. We avert our attention. We don't answer. We make like we didn't hear. We make like there's a phone. That, that's what we do is our response to homelessness. Donation, some old clothes. So what we wanted to do, what we set out to do, was to try to tell a story that actually put a human face on it. That, that, that created a connection with you that said, I understand that that person could be me if not for some things happening in their life. And then the campaign focused actually on teenagers because of the disproportionate amount of teenagers under 18 that are homeless. And we ended up uh, actually generating over 400,000 genes for teens, actually genes that were donated to shelters across the country and 1.4 million pounds of food. But really what mattered was using all of the, the film content and then original content, which you'll hear me call shoulder content, around the film in order to get people to connect and realize that you are that person. And uh, here's an example of one very short form piece that we did.
So we used this, this video in a, in a few different ways that um, actually ended up uh, being seen a couple million times. American Express took it on as a commercial. Uh, and what it ended up doing is leading to tens and thousands of uh, incoming inbound calls across the country because we tracked the calls that came in with the codes, the mobile text codes with it, uh, for people volunteering and, and wanting to help. And again, it, by the way, that was $1,500 that cost us. Mo and, and that was five years ago. Most of that stuff now can be done by anybody in the back table that's under 18 over there uh, in about an hour as a probably your eighth grade project. You know, I mean, that's, that's the wonderful piece of technology, the good side of, of what technology is doing in compressing. So we know that there's a, there's a place for these. If we can get them in that inspiration mode, it's all about that, that way to inspire. Now, all these things we do, by the way, we talk about, oh, we did this, we did that. The we is not us. The we is not participant. The we is a collaboration with NGOs experts. And what we've learned, and I'm sure this is not the case of the people in the room because you all agree on everything. You have complete uniformity in all your conversations. That um, this might surprise you, but in the NGO and nonprofit world, sometimes they all are equally passionate about the same social issue, but they don't necessarily agree with each other on how that issue should be solved. And what we've tried to do is use the film as a watering hole, saying, look, you all need water. You might want to go kill each other out on the Masamara, but, but you all need this. Let's use this together as that common place where we gather. Let's push the issue into the zeitgeist, and then let each of you join the conversation and tell your story and explain and articulate to people why these solutions, your view, these things should happen. So all we're trying to do is actually raise the visibility of that issue. Because, uh, and, and again, this, we, we say this over and over because it's, for, it's critical to who we are as a company. We don't have a point of view. We're not partisan. We didn't set out to make you think that green is the super color and everybody should wear it. We're only interested in getting people to think. That's all that matters to us. Is, and if they're inspired and they're informed, then they're going to think and then they're going to get engaged. So that led us to this whole idea of collaboration and that partners are not an additive. It's not one plus one. It's a multiplier effect. It's, and we, we did this, as I said, with, with, uh, with the soloist, and we also did this with uh, a film called Food, Inc. And we wanted to pull the screen back on misinformation, agriculture, and so forth. Again, not saying this is bad, this is good, but just do you understand where your food comes from? Do you understand the origins of food policy and how it affects you as an individual. So we formed a coalition of a hundred partners. So think about herding cats. A hundred partners and distributed a curriculum that they all agreed on that ended up going to 17,000 classrooms and in addition to 3,000 high schools with a separate uh, discussion guides and then DVDs that went along with them and then house parties that went on about 10,000 of those where people uh, hosted a house party and then we put you know, uh, the, the uh, authors and director and others on a common call that they could have after those house parties at their house. And today we still talk with 650,000 people in our food, in food community multiple times every month. New, new uh, information, origins of food, ways that you get involved in connectivity. And again, the idea is inspire, inform, form these communities so we can keep talking to them. An example of this concept of coalition building when sometimes everybody has the same goal but not the same method to get to that goal would be with Waiting for Superman. Now Waiting for Superman we set out as an ode to teachers. That's what we wanted to do. We, so for two years into this, remember my background at the beginning. So we went to Davis Guggenheim, the director of Inconvenient Truth, and said, Davis, we've got a great idea. We want to get the American education system into the zeitgeist. The work of teachers, the power that, 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 that really a teacher holds in the future of the country. We need to tell this, how do we get that? And Davis said, the only thing I can think of that's harder than the climate would be to try to talk about the American education system. And he said, no. And about four months later, he came back in and he said, you know, I want to meet with you. And he sat down with myself and the head of documentaries, Diane Wireman, he said, all right, I'll take it on. And I don't know what the film and where it's going. I'm, he, he did a film early on in his career called um, uh, First Year, which was about four teachers followed him the first year. It's an issue he very much cared about. And he said, I'll take this on. And when we finished the film, 
and he finished the film because these are creative directors and they have their, their view. And we, our goal was how can we get people to emotionally connect and get involved? And what was interesting was it sparked a lot of conversation. And other people started to use it as a platform. Is it anti-union? Does it, you know, what does this mean? Is it magnet? Is it public school? It was all those things. Now we had, in this case, over 200 NGOs working together, focusing on things like Common Core Standards passing, more funding for uh, teacher training. Uh, these, these goals that were the goals that all the organizations agreed on. So these, these, what we call these multiplier goals, goals that they want to feed people in. Millions of people coming to the website, over a million people signed up for the community. All of these things happening. Uh, we, we screened the film to over 50% of the legislators across the United States. All designed to get the film into the zeitgeist, which it ended up happen that hap that happened. But when we found out that there was, in particular, AFT and Randy Weingarten, who was who had issue with some of the elements of the film, we said, you know what? That's a voice that has to be heard. So every single panel discussion, every single uh, time that we, you, we hosted a discussion about that film across the country, Randy or one of the, the uh, you know, her designees was on that panel representing a, a perspective that had, to be on the, that had to be in the conversation. What AFT did was change the conversation, added a whole dimension to the conversation, and actually fostered more communication than ever would have happened if we had said, that's not our problem. We made a film, we don't really care what you said, and that's not our problem. So what we did is sought out to embrace it, and to, and to Randy and AFT's credit, they did an extraordinary job of going into every single session, and instead of saying, we don't want anything to do with it, we're, we're not gonna be part of your, your um, your social action campaign, they said, we got it. I will always have somebody there, always. And they were there, and they were, and they were, and they were representing the viewpoints and the things that were very important to them. And again, at the end of the day, what I wanted to do was make sure, what the company wanted to do was make sure, what all the people worked on social action wanted to do was to make sure that, that education was something that we were talking about. And so when it's on two full hours of Oprah, when the president's talking about it, when you know, we have uh, these conversations going on at legislative uh, uh, level, at the state level, the, and we're having all of this, you know, the cover of Time magazine. What we cared about was education, and that that, that became part of the, uh, the conversation. Now, since then, actually, on September 6th on CBS, we're going to do a two-hour special called Teach. And uh, what's interesting about that is this special will look at teachers for public school public school teachers, non-magnet, public school teachers, uh, and this is a, the most positive, inspirational tool. The focus of, of this show and the campaign, which we're going for two years, is we want people to realize that a teacher, it's kind of like, here's a doctor, and then here's a teacher. And so it's all about the teaching profession being the most important profession, because look, you know, if you look at where teachers are held in the in the hierarchy of respected professions, and you look at those economies from a social justice standpoint, from an economic standpoint, that's where the advanced ones are. But and, and, and it's it's a it's the reason we're taking this on again is there was one moment in Waiting for Superman, which was my my favorite moment, where it said about all of the rankings where the U.S. was uh, relative to top 25, 17th, 19th, 18th, and all these different things, except for one area, we were number one. We were number one in thinking we were number one in all the other areas. <laughs> we have more confidence than any other country in the world, but also sometimes not all the information to understand you know, where we really sit in the realities of it. So again, this idea of embracing people who don't agree with you, including them in the conversation, is a critical uh, lesson that we learned early on. If you shut them out, the conversation is one-dimensional and no longer is going to um, involve them at all. So we go into this concept of now you've done this, you've inspired, you've empowered. How do you get people to feel good about what they're doing? Sometimes learning themselves is not enough. Now, it is if you feel good when you turn the water faucet off, maybe after you've learned that I can really help. Or I'm changing, I'm not going to eat grass, you know, I'm going to eat grass-fed instead of grain-fed beef because now I understand why, or cage-free, and so forth. But sometimes you need that moment, that thing that just goes, damn, I feel good, you know. 
that was great. I did my part. I'm part of, I'm part of the group. And we wanted, we wanted to figure out how to get people to think in that moment of inflection and in a compelling way. So we really found how to do this around a film called The Cove. The Cove is a film that took a look at a slaughter that's been going on for a hundred plus years in a cove in Japan where they slaughter hundreds of dolphins with spears. And then they harvest the meat and sell it to the schools locally. These fishermen do this. They herd them in with nets into a cove and then they slaughter these dolphins. And they let them bleed out alive and then they haul them up. And that food that they're, the dolphins are one of the most mercury laden fish and so that they're feeding mercury-laden fish, which in many cases was being mislabeled as whale meat, to uh, schools and then, being, and then sold. And so the film documented this and the idea of trying to get people to act. So we actually embedded a mobile text code at the end of the film before the credits went up that said, you can do something about this right now. Text this number here, and a letter will go to the ambassador of the United States in Japan, the Japanese ambassador, asking them to stop that slaughter which, by the way, happens every September. And the reaction from people, so we were the opposite. Please turn on your mobile phones inside a theater. Uh, and the reaction was, was huge. Millions of people, millions, over two million, did this. We suspended the, the dolphin slaughter, suspended it again. It came back, had to reactivate the group, suspended back, and this has been now the ongoing battle since then that hasn't stopped in terms of trying to change this behavior. But again, this idea, that moment of, of, I can do it, give me something right now that I can move. And technology is really the lead that's really helping us with that. We did around Countdown to Zero. This was a film that, if, if you remember, it came, this, this documentary came out right at the time of the New, uh, new, the new Start 2, so New Start, which was the treaty that just was ratified a few years back, that if you remember for, for a while was not going to be ratified. It needed five votes. And there were seven targeted senators who said that they hadn't decided. And so what we did around the film was to show it to key influencers, groups, schools, and universities, because documentaries in general don't necessarily see the widest audience theatrically, and all with the purpose of getting them to text to those key seven senators in those seven states to encourage them to vote for New Start. And fortunately, all seven voted for it. And again, this was this part of a consortium. How do you get people together, all who are working separately, who weren't strong enough separate to work together as one group for a common outcome? Now, we also, we also um, figured out that once you've done that, you have to empower this involvement. They have to, you give them that little spark, but then you have to, they have to really feel like they're able to do it, that they understand the value of creating a personal moment of enlightenment and a spark to action. Because that's when the best traction comes in that hierarchy of how people activate. The most comes when they feel like I'm in control, I'm empowered. So we did this around um, a, a documentary which just came out called A Place at the Table. And this looks at the nearly 50 million people who go to bed every night in the United States of America, either hungry or food insecure, meaning that they don't know where their next meal is coming from. 50 million, 12 million kids. And, but none of us really worry about it because we see these kids and we go, but they're, they're heavy. I don't understand. They're overweight. They're, there's no food shortage. You know, but when you're in, when your food choices are, you know, things that don't involve fresh fruit and, and, and healthy food, you get a, you know, the, the visual, it doesn't agree with the reality. And so we had to articulate information which maybe changed the visual that people weren't aware of and dis demystify the stigmas around SNAP, which is, for some people, was the old food stamps program, which you know by that. And which is now, if, you, if, if you've been following what's going on, has been a continuous battle because the concept is to pull SNAP, reduce the funding out of the reauthorization. And there's been a couple key wins that our coalition that we're a part of has been working on to save SNAP from being cut because there's a correlation between the loss of that food in that child's life and all the other social ills that occur around that. So 
we, we're, you know, it's a continuous battle. But what we were doing, what we did is we looked at the white space and we said, how do we empower people to get involved? So let's create a national database with all the organization's information that allows you to know where to go for help, where to go for food, where food is available, where shelter is available, where you can find a way to actually improve yourself. Or if I want to do something, I can, I know where I can plug in. From food companies who want to donate to one shelter's out of food and half a mile down the road another shelter isn't and where you shift and where you donate. And this was done with this consortium of, of organizations that we, we were part of bringing together around the film. We used the film as a way to get them in the room. They agreed this was the big issue because we don't have the solutions as a company. We look to the experts to say, tell us what, we know, the issue, we know it's an issue, what are the solution, parentheses S, as I said, because there's usually multiple, multiple solutions. And that's the approach that's driven our interest. Always trying to look for the white space, looking for that solution. If you look at The Visitor, this was a small film uh, and uh, very, very well uh, received that looked at the issues and impact of deportation. And in this country, uh, somebody who is going to be deported has no rights to a lawyer, has no rights, you have no rights to know where the person has been transferred to. Most of the facilities are private. It's a, it's a, uh, it's, they're not public facilities. So they're being run by private enterprises. And so we joined with O'Melveny Myers and brought together a pro bono training program and a national case study program and to have so far trained 250 lawyers who represented several thousand detainees at least so that they have the most basic legal representation when they're going to these hearings. So the, what, what we also saw in this issue of empowerment that this, this concept of um, understanding the source of the material, understanding where the information is coming from, that transparency issue is critical. When they don't think it's transparent, we have, they just don't react, they flatline. We can't get an activation from folks. But when they, they know that where this material is coming from and they can decide if that source is worthwhile, it changes. And we saw this around a film called Page One, A Year in the Life of the New York Times. And this was a documentary that looked at this kind of convergence between traditional media and new media because everybody can be a reporter because I can blog. So I'm now equal to, you know, Carr, the, one of the top, you know, writers in the New York Times. I'm, do that. I, I'm published. I'm a published writer, you know. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm doing. Go watch Awkward on MTV. You'll see. You're a published writer. The whole series is you write a blog and now you're, you get a TV show and you're, you're a writer. And we, we wanted to kind of... Uh, remove that veil that exists and have people understand this concept of a source and, and looking at who the source is and understanding the source. Here's a, um, here's a short clip which gives a, a good example of it. Thank you. 
So, um, we, again, it, it was an introduction in a way the film was, was endeavoring to really, to try, really try to articulate the difference between one, a professional source and, a, and a, uh, an, a, an amateur. And an amateur not in the sense of not being good at what they do, but just not having the professional training and the professional background. And so working with ProPublica, what we did is we, we uh, developed a curriculum that went into uh, 60 different uh, schools of journalism across the country which started to look at the analysis of how a story occurs and this one happens to follow the uh, prize-winning story Pulitzer Prize winning story about Memorial Hospital uh, at, at Katrina and how an architect you know uh, really showing the the these concept of research and verification and, and transparency and authentication as part of a journalistic experience and and we know that 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 this concept of source is something that is rapidly disappearing from the view of the consumer from a generational standpoint because they don't think that I need to worry about it beyond the fact that the source is, it's in print, meaning on the web. That's the version of print, so it must be real. And, and this is going to continue to be a, a larger and larger problem, something that we're very, very much committed to trying to continue to debate. But we, we've realized that as we get to um, really the close of these, these uh, these key learnings that participant has seen have, have worked for us. We, wa we wanted to really talk about the need to understand who your customer is. It's almost a marketing approach like a corporation. Well, we, we do it in the, in a, as a classroom teacher, I do it. I need to know where my kids are coming from, what their background is, what their, what their uh, propensity and experience and understanding and motivation and other circumstances are. If I don't have those things, I can't properly create that that focus, and sometimes you're surprised by the outcome. When we started down Lincoln, which, by the way, the first page of a page of a script is worth one minute on screen, give or take. It's about a minute. When uh, Tony Kushner did the first version of Lincoln, it was 500 pages. <laughs> it was a 10-year process that Steven Spielberg had worked on this film to get on screen. It took him a year to convince Tony uh, uh, to Daniel Day Lewis to do the film. And again, it was a film that normally wouldn't be a film that uh, a studio would look at as a blockbuster. Fortunately, it turned out to be a, a, a huge success worldwide, but uh, it won on paper that doesn't pencil out that way. And so we did some research ahead of time. We took a look and we said, all right, well, everybody knows who President Lincoln is, so that's going to be no problem. Uh, and then we found out that really two-thirds knew very little bit about this man. And they knew almost nothing about his accomplishments, and that was, you know, okay, we get that. But then we found out that virtually nobody knew that the Emancipation Proclamation, or they all, virtually everybody believed that the Emancipation Proclamation is what freed the slaves. That that permanently freed the slaves forever. And by the way, there was a percentage of people who did not know what the Civil War was about, the main cause, and what the outcome was. You know, so... And based on, you know, I think there's some people who don't think it's over yet, but that's a separate issue over wine we can talk about. Um, so it really kind of blew the, the intensity of what people knew. We were all ready to go to advanced learning techniques, curriculum, you know, we don't have to worry about naming characters, everything else too. Wow. Better take a step back, go to a primer curriculum, teach, you know, develop a discussion guide and a curriculum, pick both, and you know what, we better use the film and only use these things as models. You've got a couple of the materials, I believe, uh, that we wanted you to have. Uh, oh, that, thanks. Thank you. Uh, but the, the idea was we had to get this in your hands, and then we had to remove the copyright issues that allow people to, for educational purposes, to duplicate you know, all of those materials, which we've done. And then we said, well, you know what? How do we get these into the schools if that's going to be a source material? So we distributed that to 37,000 high schools. To every single high school in the United States received the DVDs and the curriculum, and with the ability to distribute that. So. It's the idea of just, you've got to create this, this, you know, this base level knowledge sometimes, even if you didn't uh, uh, think so. So the other thing is we took a look at, and uh, this is a film that came out this year, was very successful, uh, called Snitch. And we've learned early on, you've got to speak the language. You've got to, you know, you've got to talk to the, you know, if you want to talk about an issue, you have to talk about it in the language. So we, we equate it to talking to Utes 
you know, talking to children, talking to uh, various ethnic groups is like talking in, in a, to somebody in another country or, in, or another language. You can't approach it like, and you can't just do, can you hear me now? You know, it can't be that, you can't be louder, you can't, re if you're not saying it to a way, in a way that they're willing to engage, you're not going to be able to reach them. And so, what we did here is we, we used interstitial content. We have this contemporary showing of a, of a film about, true story about uh, a kid who had his uh, a son going off to college, good student, his friend who's a freshman in college says, hey, a box is coming, you gotta just, just collect the box, don't worry about it, just collect the box, I'm bringing some stuff back. You know, he's kinda like was the high school guy who just, was the guy you got your pot from. And he was off in college, and he, before the, the, the kid who's going to college says, don't, nah, don't, don't send it to me. He goes, yeah, just do it. So the UPS truck comes, comes up front, he thinks for a second, he signs it, it's a true story, and of course opens the box inside among, uh, you know, a big bag of fake uh, ecstasy pills is, a, uh, is the FBI's card, the raid in, and automatically, no, the judge has no no um, authority whatsoever under the minimum sentencing guidelines, he gets 10 years. Unless he snitches on somebody, which is why his friend made him up as a, as a pusher and said, I'll give you somebody, and made him, and his sentence got reduced to two years. That's the federal law. That judge has no leeway. And so we use this as the, kind of the emotional story. Dwayne Johnson's the dad, the, you know, the, the heroic, what happens. He ended up, again, true story, how he un uncovers a whole drug ring and this trucks that blow up and it's all the, all the stuff that gets lots of people going to see a film. But we also wanted to do some things along that were a little bit more irreverent and could we reach out to the target audience that we wanted to talk to and use his materials to kind of create awareness because there were some laws pending like SB9 which passed in California and that, that are starting now to look at the reform of minimum sentencing guidelines because every single sheriff, police, ju judicial, uh, civil rights agency is, is saying we've got to reform these laws. They don't work and we've got to reform them. And uh, so here's a... Here's a, uh, a little example of how we took a, a little bit more of an irreverent look at something that was primarily designed for high school kids. Thanks. So we found that, again, in the, in the millennial world, in these younger generation, boy, you really, you, if, if we were trying to say, do you know this is really serious, you could go to prison. Do you know how, 
You know, we, we lost them, and they'd have five other uh, devices in front of them that they'd be moving and not even listening. So we, we, we're really using humor more and more, short-form content as a way to get the information condensed uh, in a way that they'll actually hear the major, the major elements. Uh, so we, we, we recognize for us that media literacy is, is the core of everything that we, we do. And it's why films are going to be really important for us, because they are they really put things into the zeitgeist. They're the big national spotlight. When you can get all of the reviews and recognition and press and movie stars, they get issues into a big way. But what they don't allow us to do is talk 24-7, 365 days to a crowd. So we suddenly said, you know what? I think we want to take a turn into television because it becomes a platform that allows us to talk to people, to do what we've done in film, but actually to do it all day long and maybe walk the talk of the things that we tell other media companies they should be doing, other television channels they should be doing. And uh, we, we, to do that, we had to take a look at who we were going to serve. It goes back to one of the lessons of learning your, seeing your target audience. Now, there's 315 million people in the United States, and we're focusing on this group, 18, 85 of them. And most of you either, all of you were one, some of you are one, uh, and many of you teach them. Uh, and many who aren't act like it. But they're an interesting animal, these folks. They're, um, they, they've been shaped by both crisis and opportunity, 9-11, uh, climate change, safety concerns. You know, but they're alter, alternately, they're really highly cared for by their parents. Almost 70% of them in some studies that just came out a week ago still live with their parents till 25 or 26. So there's this combination of the concepts of safety and are entwined with this need for, for independence. They're aware of the issues facing the world, probably more aware than, than the prior uh, generation. And they're, they're very much empowered to know about the world around them through technology. And they develop and manage their identities online. They, with want and abandon, will just throw everything that they don't want people to know up online do not care. They believe transparency is a sign of authenticity. If I tell you everything, then I'm being authentic. And they, they reveal the details about themselves. They don't care. It's fine. And to them, that's their social currency. The more I tell you, the more you're going to want to follow me. It's the Kardashian effect. And they, they like to explore things themselves. They do not like to be told what to do. And they hate labels that you can be put into a group and that you can be marginalized that way. And they define success different than our generation, uh, even though until I look in the mirror, I keep thinking I'm one of them, and then I look in the mirror and I go, nah, nah. Now, especially with my daughters who are 22 and 25, it just doesn't play. Uh, and they like nice things. Believe me, they, this generation, they, they like nice stuff. But they don't like, it's not about how do I get the biggest house, the biggest yacht, the biggest plane. I want to have a house. I want to have nice things. I like, I like clothes. I like that stuff. But I don't have to have the most of everything. I want to find some sort of balance. So they're looking for things that are authentic, transparent, and, and independent sources of information they can trust. It's really important to them. They do not like to be told how to think. They do not want to watch a channel that even agrees with what they think if it's not providing the entire spectrum of views so they can then decide what they think. So they mistrust something that even could be saying what they want to hear if they're only hearing that. So really, we, you know, remember, this, this generation, 5,000 ads a day they're bombarded with. Think about that. 5,000 media messages a day is what, is what they are processing and through multiple windows at the same time, right? They never, very seldom do they watch one thing at the same time. And they're used to what they want, when they want, how they want, any way that they want in as many in as many segments, so they're they're very you know they're very unique and interesting animal uh, as a as a group, and they're very much sought after, but they're very difficult to get their attention. So very few have been able to capture it. So being that it's a really hard thing to do, we said that's exactly what we want to do, and we focused on that particular group. So we're going after millennials, and we you know what's interesting for us is uh, this channel, which is called Pivot launches August 1st. It'll be in over 40 million homes. And it's our opportunity to live what we talk about in terms of media liber literacy. Here's a little introduction of the channel.
So I, I wanted to, this is not a commercial for Pivot. It's a commercial really for, um, or really uh, a pledge that we're gonna live this concept of uh, digital media literacy and media literacy uh, from the very core and fabric and genetics of the channel. And uh, no doubt this group will, will keep us very honest if we, if we don't do that. But so when we launch, media literacy is going to be an integral part of the channel. And it's uh, really, we, we want the audience to be aware of their advertising, the source information, the content, where it comes from, who's funding it. And also, we want to help them with the tools that they, we think they need in a highly complex society to understand the information that's coming in and then to be able to process it and source it and make, make those uh, decisions from a standpoint of being well informed. And I think that this, this issue of how much I put online, how much I live online, multiple windows that they live in are going to really, we think it's, it is going to be the next massive significant social wrestle that we have as we start to talk about unmanned drones and cyber warfare and virality. And this is going to be the social issue about how, privacy and transparency and authenticity. And uh, it's creeping up, up on us because we're mesmerized by gadgets. We're mesmerized by new features. I came here to talk to you about media, media literacy from our viewpoint, from a media company viewpoint. And while waiting in the car, I clicked on updating 17 of my iPhone uh, things and then just clicked on the one I agree, never scrolled down, never looked at anything, and just I updated. I don't even know what the updates were. I have no idea what I updated. I, I know that there were like, as I said, a bunch of them and I wasn't going to read each one and scroll down, so I just clicked on I agree to all of it and it just went. It was great. And I didn't have to do anything. And Apple took care of it for me. They're wonderful. <laughs> you know? So it's just one simple button and, and my life is easy. And I think there's going to be an awakening that's going to come around that when we start to go, whoa, wait, what did I do? I never did that. Yes, you did. And by the way, people who are saying, I never read that long thing, and then they go to court, they're losing. They're, they're losing every case because you clicked I agree. You lose. And when enough of that builds up, we're going to see some interesting, because you won't see class action lawsuits. You won't see all this stuff because you agreed. And I think that that's going to be a, a, a real uh, interesting piece. We're actually, when we launched the channel, we, we picked up a film uh, that uh, was one of the hits of the uh, festival circuit as one of the initial premieres for the channel. Uh, and it's called uh, Terms and Conditions May Apply. And it's, uh, it's an interesting documentary. Here's a, here's a short little uh, uh, promo on the, on the film.
So, we, uh, by the way, we are having a private influencer screening uh, coming up on the 17th, 18th, 17th in Santa Monica. Uh, screening of the film and then a panel discussion afterwards. If you and a guest, an invitation to everybody in the room, um, we'll get the information to you at the end. Um, for those of you who'd like to attend, you know, we'd like you to be our guests at, at the uh, inaugural kind of influencer screening in Los Angeles for that. So it, it's, it's quite a revealing film. Of course, it's, it's information you live with each day. And I, and I think what makes it so in interesting to us is that in most cases it's, oh, the corporation's bad, go get them, burn it down. This isn't the case. Corporation hasn't done anything wrong. It's not that they took advantage of us. They asked us and we said yes. You know, so it's a change that's going to, that's why I'm saying that it's different than the typical, oh, you know, that company was bad. They're Enron. They took advantage. It's not that. They, they have, they said, we're going to do this. And we went, okay, thank you. I got a pretty feature. So it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating world. It's definitely for the, that's the, that, by the way, that session will be at 9 p.m. tonight at the bar, you know, um, <laughs> over there. So anyway. I didn't mean to get off into the world that you know far more about I do, other than to say that what you do is extraordinarily important to us, and media literacy is something that, it's funny, it's everything that everybody, oh, I know what that is, it's learning to read, you know, and, uh, you know, I have to understand hard thoughts, you know, and they don't really understand the depth of what, what, what uh, you are delving into and in, in your expertise and what you're, what you're seeking to understand and try to understand more of, and I think that is what's very powerful about the work that you're doing in the room. Uh, you know, is, you know, I like the quote from Edward R. Murrow. We started with it and just say that there's a great and perhaps decisive battle to be fought against ignorance, intolerance, and indifference. And to us, that's the power of media literacy. That's the power of digital media literacy. That's, that's the responsibility that a few of us, uh, like you and, and us who are such big fans of the work you do, uh, that matter so much. And that's why we're working so closely with Namely. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you for the time. I appreciate you spending it with me. And thanks. Out of time for questions. Thanks. Bye. Um, hello? Okay, I am really, really excited about Pivot, and I'm wondering um, how Participant is going to reach us millennials who don't have televisions. Oh, you know, it, I, you know very interesting. And, and I'll be quick about this. It's a great, I, I hate, you know, I, I almost slipped into the, the, the teacher 101 mistake, right? Great question. All your other ones are stupid, but that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, and it's more like thank you because that's a really important point to us. You know, when, when we went to launch the channel, we realized you're going to talk to this audience. Remember we talked about you've got, to, you've got to talk to them where you want, when you want, how you want. And for us, we said, you know what, to do that, we've got to provide this as in, in a different way. So what we're setting out to do, and we're going to be announcing the uh, cable operators and others that, that are carrying the channel linear, meaning through the box in your house, an ability to actually buy it a la carte. So that you can buy a year subscription for the channel for you know, $12. I mean, some very nominal amount. And you get the channel streamed 24-7. Plus the HBO Go version of different shows, so to speak, that you can just take a la carte. But you'll get right through your iPhone, through your iPad, through your you know, computer, laptop. You'll be able to stream the channel anywhere, anytime, anywhere in the country, at any time of the day, just as a linear channel running. So that's how we're going to address it. Cool. Mm -hmm. Kind of going along with that, um, it seems like you're talking about shoulder content, that there's all this kind of opportunities for us to engage with these films or these TV shows. Um, I noticed on the pivot.org you're doing some stuff with hitrecord.org. Um, Tiffany Schlang came yesterday and talked about collaborative filmmaking. What are, is Participant doing anything to encourage that kind of, kind of collective, collaborative media making, not just kind of responding to the media that you've provided for us, but us kind of participating in the making of it as well? Yes, uh, actually, we're, we, we're creating a network, a social action network, trademarked, uh, that is uh, going to be, it, that is launching, uh, it's in a couple universities now, and the dream is that it goes across 
hundreds of universities when it's fully realized. And these groups are organizations, they're, they're media groups of people who are like, uh, what, what, what you're referring to is, Hit Record is a Joseph Gordon-Levitt, uh, an actor who formed this website called Hit Record, and he does these live shows where he, in, and he does these calls through the web that brings in animators, uh, artists, musicians, drawers, and they collaboratively make media. And he serves as the director. So he, there is somebody making a decision. It's not a joint, you know, creation of the media. But they supply the raw material, and then he turns that in to a finished piece. And we actually have a series that launches uh, in a to-be-announced time in the next six months that will be a, a, a series with Joe that is going to be hit record on TV. We will actually be doing that through TV. But more than that, through the calls through, through hit record, what I was mentioning about the Social Action Network is this network of universities that are going to have these these, these organizations, they're more than clubs, because club diminishes the nature of it. It's a permanent presence on the campus in which people will be making uh, content at that level in all those different mediums, feeding it to us, and then we will be combining, editing, and broadcasting it. So we are creating a national network in which we're going to be able to do that type of uh, media outreach. I think we have time. We'll squeeze in one last one. Uh, I wonder if you ever uh, worry about, uh, particularly with the, the short animated uh, snitch video, if you make it so entertaining and kind of fun to watch that the message might get lost. It might go viral and people might giggle at it, but right. then they don't actually take action, go to the website, do anything about it. And we do worry about it, and it happens. And what we do is, besides the research in front, we research afterwards and we have ongoing focus groups plus a panel of a couple thousand people that are on through through our rent track and Nielsen that we we can put this in front of them first and say okay are we missing something here because we're like laughing our asses off thinking this is the funniest thing in the world it gets in front and they go like this you got to be kidding me you know I don't under and so we, we that happens to us so we've now not only do we look at it in the front end but on the back end every time somebody walks out of a theater we we uh, survey over a thousand people you know the surveys that come out, did you enjoy the film and so forth? That's a cinema score that you get. The same people for our films not only ask you the questions about the film, do you give it an A, do you give it an A minus, a B plus? They say, what did you know about uh, minimum sentencing before you saw Snitch? What do you know afterwards? Did your opinion change at all? There's six questions tagged on to the, uh, to the piece. So what we're trying to do is continuously evaluate that. And we're focusing right now on a, a, pa a, a new concept, this index that participant will be launching in combination with some of the big players, Gates and Lear Center and, and Rentrack and so forth, that will have this standing panel in the thousands and thousands that will actually crawl all related media about it, pull and tell us what behaviors and conversations are going on. So we can start to have this multi-level uh, way to understand the impact that the media is having to change what we're doing, to alter what we're doing. And in the world of online, it's so easy to to pull shift switch and one hour later change an, uh, a piece of something to get out. So the answer is we, we wrestle with it all the time. And so now we're, in, we're putting it into the institutionalizing, into the infrastructure, research on the front end, analysis on the back end, with the, accept, with, with the understanding that we will not always be successful at it. By the way, the other thing I should mention is uh, there's a couple people here, Kent in the back standing, the kind of, you know, see that kind of hair thing that, that is, that is just, I was, there are so many things I want to say and I won't because I have to be nice, but um, Kent is phenomenal. Kent has been a long-time supporter of this organization, is heading up an initiative with, namely, that there are, we're producing a 30-minute special to kick off our media literacy campaign, uh, produced in partnership with Namely, and an ongoing series of interstitials that are part of the program, because we have this very extensive website, uh, on-air, interstitials, comprehensive 24-7 type of approach to media literacy that isn't just what we pick to put on the channel, but actually this commitment to educate and inform and inspire people about this issue. So this, is, this isn't a campaign that stops. It's part of the channel, and it will be unprecedented, and no channel in the history of television will do as much around this issue as this channel will. So uh, Kent will be here all day. He is uh, one of the senior executives, most senior executives of the channel, and Jaime is way to right here. Jaime, just raise your hand. Uh, heads up social action advocacy for our television group. 
and uh, in Pivot and is working hand in hand in terms of all those specific messages that are going to occur on the channel. And they'll be here uh, for the whole afternoon. So please grab them and, and give us input, give us uh, resources, give us ideas. We're, we're in the sponge mode and we're very much interested because you're the experts. As we said, we reach out to the experts. You tell us what we need to know. You tell us what we need to be focusing on. And we coalesce all that together and come up with those common messaging that work across all groups. Thank you. Jim, please join me thanking Jim Burke. I know we went a little bit longer, but I think it was well worth it. So I'll just let everybody send off to your next session. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you.